it's music from yeah okay just give us a second there mm. a combination of cultural events film music and then meetings speeches discussions steve actually helped us in dublin to set up the dublin workers film festival some years ago so we, we've uh, had a few of those but not quite as big a cultural event as the ones that Stephen has, has been organizing. The um, issue of the United Front is particularly relevant uh, today. There's need for mass workers' parties, not just in the US, but right across the developed uh, capitalist uh, world. And even in other uh, countries, which wouldn't be as much associated with, with that uh, development in South America and other places. So there is a need for a United Front. The United Front is only one step towards the creation of a mass workers party, which is what we're trying uh, to achieve. And socialism, <laughs> the struggle of socialism is an international struggle, so every country is involved. So even though Steve's own uh, base is in America, the points that he makes often at our meetings relate to every, every country. The social democracy has betrayed its working class uh, base in several countries, the most obvious ones being France, and uh, the United Kingdom. But in other countries such as Italy, Spain, Greece, where they, they were once mass communist parties, mass socialist parties, these have now disappeared. And in Brazil, the Workers' Party again had many opportunities to take power and to change society and didn't avail of these opportunities. Now they have a further opportunity. So the United States is rich in its labor traditions, which is not widely known because of the dominance of the Republican and Democratic Party. A rich tradition, not just in the trade unions, but also the American Communist Party was very influential in the past. The mass movements towards unionization in the 30s. So there's a very rich history in America of class struggle. So we look forward to hearing Steve's uh, contribution to building the United Front in his own particular experience in America. But also, this applies, as I said, across all the countries of the advanced uh, capitalist world. So, Steve, how long do you think you might be speaking for? Um, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Well, go ahead then. Okay. Go then, Steve, so. okay. Well, welcome, comrades. And <clears throat> I think that um, it's a good opportunity uh, to talk about United Fronts and how United Fronts can be. Uh, important in the development of the working class and confronting the uh, crisis that the, the, in capitalism and also resolving the crisis of, of, of uh, political crisis in the working class. So the gr growing class struggle, financial crisis, climate catastrophe, catastrophe, and dangers of another world war require that the working class resolve this crisis by taking power. Uh, one of the most important policies for taking this forward is the building of a united front of the working class around class issues. Uh, one of the struggles is the fight by Marx for the formation of a Labour Party in Britain in February. Uh, in February 1848, Marx and Engels' uh, Manifesto of the Communist Party was published, in fact, in London. And Marx and Engels had been asked by the Communist League to produce a document to use to recruit members. And uh, so they wrote several documents. In Britain, the formation of the Labour Party took place in 1900. And at that time, uh, they, uh, Marx said, the communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. They have no interest separate apart from the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. The communists are distinguished from the other working class parties by this only one in the national struggles of the proletarian of the different countries they point out and bring to the front of the common interests of the entire proletariat, independently of all nationalities, and two, in the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeoisie has to pass through and always as and everywhere represent the interests of the movement as a whole. Um, that was Marx and Engels. Um, so in 1892, three workingmen took their seats and were elected to the British Parliament as the first workers to become members of the House and Commons. And in January 1883, 1893 rather, the Independent Labour Party was formed and uh, took up a fight um, in Engels at that time in the ILP platform called for collective ownership and control of the means of production, distribution, and exchange, an eight-hour day. And um, uh, Keir Hardy was made chairman of what would one day Britain's Labour Party. And um, 
and at that time the um the Labour Party was affiliated to the Socialist International. And in, in the debate uh, that Lenin had, uh, Lenin viewed the Labour Party not as a party based on socialism, class struggle, but representing the first step, a uh, uh, first step of the part of the really proletarian organization of Britain towards a conscious class policy and towards a socialist workers party. Uh, so this development of the Labour Party in Britain was seen as a, as a fundamental step for the working class and organizing political independence. Um, and uh, now I think one of the things we I wanted to do in this uh, talk is talk about United Front tactics um, and how the Marxist movement, the communist movement has have, uh, seen these tactics as critical uh, for the defense of the working class and uh, the need to unite the working class and protect democratic rights and stop fascist or military coups was also a critical lesson in the attempted overthrow of the social democratic government of Kerensky by Kornilov. Um, it, it's, um, that fight was uh, uh, to link up, uh, not politically support this, uh, uh, Kerensky, but to link up in a united front against a coup, uh, which is, is very important today in relationship to what's going on in the United States, particularly with the rise of fascism. So, uh, at that time, I mean, it was uh, there. Uh, the, the Lenin <clears throat> defended that and said uh, that it was critically. Even now, we must not support the Kerensky government. This is unprincipled. We must. We ha we may be asked, aren't we going to fight against Kornilov? Of course, we must. But this is not the same thing. There's a dividing line here, which is being stepped over by some Bolsheviks who fall into the compromise and allow themselves to be carried away in course of events. We shall fight. We are fighting against Kornilov. Just as Kerensky's troops do, but we do not support Kerensky. On the contrary, we expose his weakness. Uh, we are charged. We are changing the form of struggle, uh, form of our struggle against Kerensky, without the least relaxing our hostility toward him, uh, without taking back a single word against him, without renouncing the task of overthrowing him. We say that we must take into account the present situation. We must not overthrow Kerensky right now. We shall approach the task of fighting against him in a different way, namely. We shall point out to the people who are fighting against Kornilov, Kerensky's weakness and uh, uh, vacillation. There has not been in the past. Now, however, it become the all important thing and this constitutes the change. So this uh, action of the uh, Bolsheviks to defend uh, Kerensky was critical in allowing for the working class to unite against a military coup and also politically exposing uh, who Kerensky was for those workers and forces that were supporting Kerensky. And the idea of the thesis on the United Front uh, by the uh, Common Turn, um, Fourth Congress of the Communist International in 1922, uh, outlined what, what the uh, United Front was and the need for uh, United Front on class issues and um, the lessons of the fight uh, with the Mensheviks in the defense of the Russian working class in, in the Russian Revolution. Um, so that, that was a very important uh, lesson, which uh, I think has uh, not been recognized or understood by, uh, I would say people call themselves Marxists around the world, and I'll go into it. Um, because the fight for United Front in the United States, particularly in light of, of the rise of fascism, uh, the lack of a working class party um, and the need to to unite the mass of workers uh, is is absolutely essential and critical. Um, so one of the uh, fights that the political fights that were made in the United States in relationship uh, to the United Front and the Labor Party was the fight by Trotsky pro Labor Party and his fight against those in the Socialist Workers Party who believe that. Uh, that you did not need to have a labor, a labor party, a United Front perspective towards a Labor Party. You could simply form your own party. So, um, and Trotsky said um, the fight for a Labor Party was at, at that time important. Uh, it can become a, a reformist party. It depends upon the development. Here comes in the question of the program I mentioned yesterday, and we'll underline it today. We must have a program of transitional demands. The most complete of them is a workers and farmers government. 
We are for a party, for an independent party of the Victorian masses who will take power in the state. We must concretize it. We are for the creation of factory committees for workers' control of industry through factory committees. All these questions are now pending in the air. They speak of technocracy and put forward the slogan of production for use. Uh, we oppose this charlatan formula, formula and advance the workers' control of production through the factory committees. So uh, Trotsky's fight for a labor party uh, in the United States um, was uh, important in the formation of the Trotsky's movement. Um, and uh, the, the lessons of the fight of the Trotsky's in the Minneapolis uh, fight were important uh, because there was a united front against the attack of the police and the National Guard and the effort to uh, destroy the union, the Teamsters Union, which the Trotskyists had won leadership in. And again, this united front uh, tactic of uh, in the working class was absolutely critical. So, uh, but, you know, again, there was a, I would say a sectarian view that in fact, uh, just you just build your own uh, political party and you don't have to, to um, uh, you don't have to worry about uniting the entire working class independently of the capitalists. So the question uh, then is the question of, of fascism and the rise of fascism, because uh, in fact, uh, the struggle to unite the working class against the fascists in Germany, uh, again, raised the question of, uh, you know, uniting the working class and breaking the working class from social democracy. And uh, the Trotsky and the, and the left opposition were for a uh, united front from the bottom up in Germany um, to unite workers against the rise of fascism. And I think that that uh, experience um, was critical um, for, for today. I mean, because the uh, trade union bureaucracy today still controls the working class and still uh, basically is a tool of the, of the capitalist ideologically. In, um, in opposing in the United States working class control uh, and accepting uh, bourgeois uh, demands and, and the capitalist framework in the economy. Um, so I think that uh, a united front of workers uh, against fascism is critical. Now, I wanna talk about some of the experiences that we've had here around the rise of fascism in the United States, which I think are important internationally because um, uh, we, the United Front Committee for a Labor Party, were actually the only organization uh, in, in January 6th uh, to call for the working class to unite uh, against the rise of a fascist coup in the United States. And we had uh, several rallies where we um, sought to bring other organizations together uh, to warn uh, the working class about the danger of fascism and also the need for workers' defense uh, and mobilization against the, the rise of fascism. And um, unfortunately, most of the left, including the left that calls themselves Trotskyists, uh, did not take uh, the rise of fascism seriously. Um, they didn't really talk about the lessons of fascism, and particularly the fight for United Front against the fascist uh, in, in Germany and the struggle that, that Trotsky made. Um, so uh, we, we had several, a couple of several small rallies, um, but the uh, the central fight, you know, was in the unions, organizing the trade union movement uh, to seriously confront the rise of fascism. And the in there were unions in the United States that were in favor of a united front against fascism, um, and that was the uh, one of them was the Vermont AFL CIO, David Van Dusen is the uh, president of them. And they, they introduced a resolution to the AFL-CIO that uh, or they, they, their, their own AFL-CIO, that there'd be a general strike if there was a coup. This is prior to the 2000, um, uh, the, the coup attempt. So um, to 2016. So what happened was, is that uh, the leadership of the AFL-CIO sought to shut them down. Uh, Richard Trumka, who was the president of the AFL-CIO said that it was out of order for them to even have a debate about a general strike and said that if they did talk about a general strike uh, against a coup or insurrection, they would put the, uh, the state federation into trusteeship. They would basically take away their democratic control. 
So we supported the, uh, the United Front Committee for Labor Party, supported a campaign to defend uh, the Vermont AFL-CIO, and they did vote to support a general strike if there was an attempted coup. And uh, so the um, so they were the they backed off and they passed the resolution. Um, and the the uh, the Richard Trumka and the executive committee, the labor of, of the AFL CIO, said later that that they uh, had discussed the the uh, general strike and decided that they didn't want to even talk about a general strike because if they had discussed a general strike. Uh, Trump would have used that as a pretext to uh, to ins institute martial law. So that's why they couldn't talk about a general strike. So there was a recognition, according to them, that they were worried about martial law being instituted. So uh, this uh, uh, is, is evidence that the, in fact, the trading bureaucracy itself were worried about a, a uh, coup uh, and a takeover of the bourgeois state by a, a right-wing or fascist force. Um, however, the, still the, the lessons of that have been lost in, in, um, in the left. There is no, uh, I mean, there are movements for a labor party, but there's no real movement in the uh, working class uh, in the unions for a united front against fascism. So we have fought to organize uh, a united front movement against fascism, and particularly in the unions, to take that up. Um, and the other question that is very important in the United States, uh, different than other countries, is the role the U.S. unions play internationally. Uh, and because as the United States as a imperialist power, uh, and they, uh, in the witch hunts that took place uh, in the United States, uh, they were successful through these witch hunts in the 50s, in destroying the left unions, the CIO, uh, United Electrical Workers, many left unions were destroyed and forming a, the AFL-CIO, which is a pro-capitalist, pro-imperialist trade union federation. And not only was this uh, trade union federation uh, support of capitalism and labor management collaboration, business unionism, but also on an international level, this uh, trade union federation was uh, part of US imperialism's uh, intervention around the world. And it worked with the CIA to overthrow uh, unions around the world, to uh, overthrow, overthrow labor organizations, and work with the capitalists and right-wing trade union bureaucracy. And that continues today internationally. The AFL-CIO um, gets $75 million a year from the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, the AFL-CIO was involved in the overthrow of Allende. This is the 50th anniversary of the coup in Chile, which the AFL-CIO was involved in. And it's involved in overthrowing the government of Venezuela and uh, in Japan, uh, Indonesia, uh, Turkey, and many other countries around the world. The AFL-CIO in collaboration with the CIA is, is a counter-revolutionary force. So one of the uh, issues of the United Front in the working class is against uh, our unions uh, being uh, partners and collaborating with the imperialists internationally. And one of the things that we are organizing with the group called uh, Labor Education Project and AFL-CIO International Operations is a, uh, a protest, a rally at the AFL-CIO on September the 11th of this year, uh, protesting the role of the AFL-CIO in overthrowing the Chilean government. Also uh, demanding opening the books demanding compensation for the workers who were killed and the harm of their families, um, and also uh, an end to taking the money from the US government. So we wanna build a united front in the unions and uh, to organize, to take up the fight for the independence of the unions against support for US imperialism. And this, again, is a united front tactic. Now, the other question is how do, uh, we work for the United Front in, in, in the union struggles. And what our view is and what our work is, we unite workers where they're at around wage demands against privatization uh, uh, and uh, against uh, racist attacks, uh, uh, attacks on gays and lesbians, LBGTQ. Uh, we need United Fronts. The rise of fascism uh, in the United States requires United Fronts, requires the United Front in the working class uh, to defend against the 
not only political attacks, but physical assaults uh, on, on workers in, in the United States. So we see the United Front uh, tactic as critical. And um, we also see this as critical to rebuilding the uh, international communist movement. Um, one of the problems, political problems of the left internationally is that there are different left groups who say that they're internationals, that say they're for a new international, but they don't have uh, solidarity, uh, international solidarity actions involving the entire working class. And the best example of that for our, us, the United Front Committee uh, Labor Party, was the uh, fight for the Clover, uh, uh, two fights, fight for the Clover um, dairy workers in South Africa uh, who were forced on strike when an Israeli uh, Zionist uh, multinational took over, was given their largest national dairy in South Africa. They approved them taking over. And there was an international campaign uh, to defend uh, the Clover workers and uh, against the strike breaking uh, by that company. And unfortunately, most uh, left organizations, including um, an organization which is affiliated to the leadership uh, of that group, WASP in South Africa, refused to or organize and educate internationally to defend the clover workers. So we found that as a very uh, symptomatic uh, of some of the political problems because people who call themselves internationals within the Trotskyist movement, um, we're not prepared to unite internationally in a united front struggle to defend the, the clover workers uh, in South Africa. That is an example of united front on, on an international level, defending workers who are uh, under attack and need international solidarity. And the same is the case, I think, in Namibia um, with the struggle of the Namibian miners. We have sought to build a united front uh, with other organizations around the world to defend the uh, Libyan, I mean, the Namibian miners, they're having an action. We're having an action on the 28th. And we have found it's it's like uh, pulling teeth to get other organizations to call themselves internationals, to unite internationally. I mean, one of the things that rebuilding uh, an international working class movement is the necessity of uniting around defending workers around the world on a, on a global basis. And we, we feel that, uh, again, United Front tactic in organizing internationally is decisive. Uh, if we can't organize internationally to support our brothers and sisters, uh, political prisoners uh, like Mumia Abu Jamal and others, how are we going to build a, a new international working class movement? So we see that again as a United Front tactic that we uh, have to take up and we are taking up. And we're working in the ILWU uh, for support of uh, a Labor Party and Mumia uh, <coughs> Abu Jamal and also for the Namibian miners. So we see internationalism as a critical component in the fight for the United Front tactic and in the fight for organizing the working class internationally. And I, I think that that is a important pathway for workers around the world. Thank you, Steve. That's a very illuminating and very important to uh, open the contribution. Um, the discussion is now open, but could I ask actually that, uh, a situation is emergency which you have to deal with uh, domestic situation. Can somebody else chair the meeting for a while until I come back? Somebody else take, take that on. Uh, I just yeah, go to... on, I'll do it. <laughs> what did you say? We, huh? Will you give me some warning when you're going? You'll be going on. Are you going now to deal with domestic? I know, yeah. I'm, 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 I apologize. I have to leave now for a while. All right. I'll be, I'll be back. It. Okay, all right, Steve. I'm sorry, comrades. It's all right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I thought that was that was a really excellent lead off, and absolutely, uh, you know, gets to the point. Who who would like to contribute to the discussion first? Definitely, hush, David. Uh, comrades, um, yeah, thanks, Steve, uh, for going over some of the historical and uh, theoretical issues. Um, you know, can I cannot say that in the past, uh, you know, we've had in, in various formations, we've had extensive discussion on the distinction between a united front and a popular front. 
and all the permutations of alliances uh, with uh, different uh, sections of uh, political parties, maybe radical nationalists and so forth in the popular front, and uh, the concentration that we make in terms of uh, uniting workers organization or uniting from below or any way possible, you know, to build the workers movement heading towards greater unification, you know, over time. Because if we look at it internationally, you know, the labor movement is extraordinarily split and is, is, is very, uh, you know, can we put it mildly in South Africa, very confused. If I could mention in South Africa, I think the last four um, shutdowns or general strikes have been run in connection with uh, different uh, nationalist parties, with the workers' movement tagging on behind, dem you know, um, dem you know uh, all, all kinds of uh, radical nationalists who, who make demagogic uh, claims and so forth. And so be supporting one faction of the national bourgeoisie against against the other. I mean, we fought against this, but this is in fact what happened uh, last Monday. Uh, and it was a catastrophic uh, failure, uh, even though it led to a shutdown. It had no political edge to it at all, and no one knew what the political issues were. Uh, in South Africa, the, that shutdown, the slogans, if you looked at uh, what people were holding up to the TV to be, uh, to be seen, were uh, Ramaphosa, keep your oath, O-A-T-H. In other words, you've not carried out your pledge to be a good president when you promised you would. Um, and another other comments uh, relating to, uh, I think something else. It's time for economic growth, not stagnation, or something. You know, something of that kind. Nothing which really cuts uh, cuts through the petty bourgeois radicalism and 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 uh, confusion in South Africa, and put forward a workers' program. And I have to say, some of the people who've spoken at our previous uh, conferences were you know, visibly participating in that, enthusiastically uh, advocating, you know, that, that shutdown. Uh, and this brings uh, a lot of confusion to, to workers because when we engage in such uh, alliances and the, every single bit of politics in South Africa at the moment is an alliance between one faction or the other with the uh, national petty bourgeois, apart from the small bourgeois party itself, and the workers are caught up in all kinds of entanglements, and and it just confuses the workers' program, you know, utterly. Uh, so you know this this question of a united front being a uni unification of a workers' organisation from directly with the leaders or or from below is what we, we you know what we should be discussing, and you know that's in, in our practical politics, and that's what we're working to. The advantage, uh, I just want to touch and leap ahead a little to the question of the resolution that was taken at the conference in Durban in January on the 29th. Uh, and, and and although comrades you know, should see it in the latest on the brink and in the various uh, distribution which you've made on wind debates and so forth, this is an example of, of a united front in action in other words, bringing together actions and priorities in workers' organizations ranging from, you know, the dock workers on the West Coast, uh, dock workers in Durban, uh, workers, uh, the our particular interest in getting, uh, you know, Gennady free and uh, getting action there uh, and in, uh, in building an international uh, combine and then a call for mass workers' parties, you know, internationally. Uh, and this was, you know, carried by, you know, substantial uh, organizations like the ILW and the Dark Workers Union and activists, you know, from, who were present. And subsequently, the Argentinian uh, Socialist Party, the Workers Party there and elsewhere. So, you know, the idea here is that we take synchronized united action as we are taking on the 28th uh, in favor of Rossing and focus in on what what unites us and build on on the points of unification and try and from there onwards you know build what in some one of the comrades uh, spelt out as a, a red line you know a red network you know internationally turning you know our wind discussions 
into a living uh, organization of struggle, uh, debate, and theory posing of theoretical issues. So it takes it all, you know, quite a quite a few uh, step forward. Uh, in in the United States, we see, as as uh, Steve pointed out, the question of united front against fascism, uh, which you know is is it's 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 not a self declared fascism, but in fascism today often you know puts on all kinds of uh, you know sheep's clothing and uh, it's you know you know it, it confuses sections of the working class you know you know quite quite considerably and we have to fight fight relentlessly to clarify the issues um, and it's not just in the states it's also in south africa where at times there's the most horrendous um uh, racism, uh, which which is called xenophobia, and a black on black violence, and we see in Tunisia at the moment, you know, the workers' organisations paralysed uh, when there is is mass action uh, from sections of the population, the petty bourgeois there in Tunisia, and so forth, actually making it impossible for black people to walk the streets and to go and shopping, and so that's why something like three thousand uh, uh, people uh, black people from, from Africa in Tunisia have been attempting to cross the Mediterranean in desperation, you know, to get away against the programs which are taking against African people. So we you have just to... Why they you know, don't be able to come back in later. Yeah. She's been on going for quite a while. Yeah, I'm just saying, so in other words, these are practical actions which you can't ignore, and we need to work to be able, together to be able to build uni unite uh, action and build success uh, to build an international organisation. Okay, thanks very much, David. Jabu. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Steve, for laying the foundation for the historical uh, convergence of what has taken place in terms of the United uh, Front issues. Uh, I always speak as a... Um, and I only speak from my background, which is a South African and then was living in the UK. So it's quite important for me to just clarify that. Uh, they, there's always this quotation of the Deben moment in South Africa, which was quite significant in terms of understanding the history of how the formulation of that, those, that strike took place. I've recently been having conversation to, I have been having conversations with my mother about how they organized in that in that era where they were not uh, they were not really affiliated to any unions in terms of uh, formulation of unions. It's quite an interesting uh, perspective in terms of how uh, the United Front was formed in terms of the union, in terms of the organizing of workers that were not unionized. Um, it's really interesting talking about that in relation to the, to the present day moment in the UK as a, a lot of uh, strikes have been taking place in terms of the uh, un unions, different, different workers uh, striking on different um, issues around health, around the rail issues around the, the UCU, which is uh, representing lecturers at universities. Whilst everyone is recognizing that uh, there's a need to fight for a, a, a living wage uh, that is just in terms of the precarious work that they are being uh, pushed towards with uh, uh, what we call lousy contracts. But there is a genuine resistance to actually um, try and, and, and kind of form a, a general sort of strike in terms of everyone recognizing that we are all suffering the same plight. I'm always, it was really interesting to see Steve lay out the foundation of what is going on in terms of the polarization of unions and, and, and the, the ideological frameworks around, uh, you know, people being fragmented and not wanting to unite for a common cause. But it's interesting, I've been really pushing in Oxford, where I live, uh, pushing around a united front. I've got Oxford Unity, which I pushed as a, you know, kind of like a, a, a what a historical um, legacy that I, I was, I grew up under United Democratic Front in South Africa as part of the UDF 
And I remember that one of the reasons why there was such a big mobilization around the anti-apartheid in South Africa was because all the organizations decided to pull together and form this united front and that gave it a much bigger cause. So I really can never understand why, uh, you know, um, organizations on the left, trade unions on the left, do not want to uh, unite and form a strong force. Uh, that is a question that I, 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 I it, it battles, it, it baffles me. But at the same time, I'm also a city councillor under the Labour Party in Oxford, which we are really struggling in terms of, you know, just now maintaining. I was very proud to be saying part of our NEC, we have a left wing, but we were really wiped out the, the last AGM. Uh, I've managed to, 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 to maintain the chair, but uh, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's getting more and more difficult in terms of uh, trying to even uh, mobilize on the left. I can see the fragmentation, but also just recognizing what Steve has said, I think we really need to go back to basics and really lay down the groundwork of what really is uh, the meaning around what uh, being on the left is. Because I think once we can really understand that, I find a lot of people are running around calling themselves left-wing uh, uh, politicians or left-wing, uh, have left-wing ideologies. And a lot of them really uh, are clueless in terms of what is happening. And there's always a question mark, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of who's the real working class. I feel there's a lot of people, especially young people who are left behind. I have young uh, people who are now of working age as my children, and I normally conversate with these young people around issues. They fully understand the issues, but the mobilization process around uh, those, th those ages in terms of how, when I was growing up, I was part of the UDF, around the ages as a teenager or even younger. And there were a lot of people my age who were joining movements. What is stopping this generation, which now has the accessibility to social media, it has accessibility to a large pool of uh, information, which we didn't. Uh, what, 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 what is the real issue around, uh, you know, the, the, the them uh, kind of, forming organizations that have been seen in the past in terms of the historical framework that uh, Steve has just laid out around, you know, the, 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 the labor movement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jabu. Matthew? Thanks, comrades, and uh, thanks to Steve for the presentation. Uh, I think... <coughs> There's a few things on this. Obviously, you know, clearly the um, as the, the classic formulation of the United Front, you know, march separately and strike together um, is important. Obviously, also, you know, the discussion, as Steve uh, alluded to, the, the, the discussion in the common turn around the United Front were worth, re, you know, going back over that. Um, I think that in terms of social democracy, actually, you know, and, and, and the second is national. That the, that the SPD is far more important than the Labour Party. The Labour Party was always the worst, actually, traditionally in, Brit in British sections and most things in European terms, um, until certainly until 1945, were always the worst, whether that was the, the Labour Party or the Communist Party, um, you know, so in those terms for various reasons. Um, but yeah, no, the, 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 the SPD, the evolution of the SPD as a, as a much more explicitly political and, and, and revolutionary organization, you know, rather than Labour Party, which is actually put together by a series of, you know, as a federation of different different forces uh, and emerges from the unions rather than, you know, for historical reasons, we can go through in terms of the, the nature of the, of the evolution of the British working class, but the SPD is, is, is much more important. But the thing is, obviously, then is, is then the collapse of that whole tradition in 1914, with the exception of Bolsheviks. I mean, Virtually every other party, the majority went, went wholesale for the war, um, and only minorities objected. Uh, and then, of course, obviously, as has been pointed out in terms of debate, you know, uh, there was then, of course, a split between those who objected 
um, to the war on, on whether it was on a pacifist basis or, or or the basis of Lenin, you know, uh, the um, you know we'll turn the war into civil war, and then obviously Lenin was in the minority. I mean, you know, um, but I think the other the other thing that that, that that Steve didn't draw out, which I think we should we should draw out in those terms, is the is the the importance of, of, of Stalinism in terms of both reviving. The the, betray, the 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 social democrats and propping up the social democrats, and then of course obviously uh, you know actually stabilizing capitalism over a whole long period, um, you know, uh, and of course um, facilitating the rise of, of Hitler. There is no there's no Hitler without Stalin. Um, you know Stalin is responsible, um, and and that whole business you know where they refuse they they basically uh, screwed up deliberately. Uh, screwed up the whole fight against fascists in Germany, and allowed, allowed the, the accession to, to power of, of, of Hitler against the, the, the uh, most uh, <coughs> organised and, and, and uh, an important working class in Europe, uh, which is, a, you know, it was a great crime, basically, and a huge setback to the whole of humanity. Uh, the thing is, obviously, we sit at the moment, of course, is the position whereby, uh, you know, the collapse of Stalinism in, in, in the early 90s, of course, you know, Leaves us a situation, you know, where, where the class struggle has been essentially been suppressed over over a period until till, till relatively recently, in which you know obviously we see that we see a rising now, but under conditions in which that you know there, there is an enormous political conflu confusion, and under conditions too where the union, uh, uh, as Steve Steve alluded to, in terms of the 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 AFL CIA, that the union bureaucracy. Of course, it has been now has been now been incorporated quite consciously incorporated by the capitalist class into the running of, 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 of uh, you know both politically and and industrially of workplaces, and that's not just the full time bureaucrats. I mean, all the way down, you know, all the way down to the floor level, you know, much of the union apparatus uh, in in industry is is, is incorporated as a, as a as a sort of secondary. Um, you know, it's a column of, of, of management, and this is this is the problem you've got. Is of course, you know, now we see a situation where the union bureaucrats, uh, you know, I mean, the TUC here here in Britain is a classic example. I mean, it, it essentially it, it nakedly works for, for the for, for the ruling class. It doesn't work for you know the TUC has not done anything at all. For the workers, um, you know, in those terms, at any time. There is a conflict. The TUC actually ser serves to 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 to, to um, uh, on the side of the of, of the capitalists, and we can see. I mean, obviously, we see that in terms of, of, of you know union struggle uh, in many parts of the world, um, the US in particular, but, but but many other places. I mean, you can see it in terms of France now. You know, it is the union bureaucracy that is is the is the principal means of control that they have. Of of the revolt of, 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 of millions of people is is actually this has been is is the principal instrument, and the question is okay you know in terms of the you know both politically and organisationally how is it that you actually sort of uh, contra, uh, counteract that you know uh, and what what forms you know in terms of how how would you apply uh, the United Front to that to that struggle? Um, so yeah, I mean I think in in, in those terms I'll I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Roger. Uh, right. Yes, thank you, Kwame. So I think uh, this is a very important question. I also think it's actually a very simple one, and there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of um, obfuscation being brought into the discussion, not into our discussion, but into generally into the movement on this question of uh, a united front by people who've got um, very good uh, uh, reasons of their own to obscure to obscure the issues. The, it's very, very simple. Uh, as, um, as Matthew said, you can sum it up in the slogan, um, strike together, march separately. In other words, uh, we, uh, we have a united action of the working class in defense of their interests, and we can have free discussion, we must have free, free debate and free right to campaign for our ideas within a united movement. Um, so therefore, uh, the political tendencies within the movement can, can organize uh, their marches, they can organize their publications, 
they can make their speeches, they can uh, they can criticize, they can make proposals. Uh, but um, when it comes to action against the class enemy, the you know, the uh, the working class stays together and acts together and strikes together. And that's the simple thing. And that's the that's the simple um, foundation on which Marx and Engels worked to build the first international. Uh, and uh, it's the, it's the principle on which Win is um, is working today. And I think um, we have to be clear about that. I'd like to give a, few, a couple of examples of how that uh, manifests itself. First of all, by the way, I think we we should be careful of this phrase united from, from below. Uh, that phrase was actually introduced as a sleight of hand and uh, an ob obfuscation, if you like, by the Stalinists. Because when in Germany, when the um, when the uh, the when Nazi when the Nazis were threatening the um, the uh, very existence of the German working class, and the Trotskyists said it is absolutely catastrophically suicidal for the Stalinists to refuse to to make a united front together with the Social Democrats, that the uh, the workers of the Communist Party and the Socialist Party and their affiliated um, or uh, trade unions and so on, that they had to operate together, side by side, in order to confront fascism. And the um, the riposte of the Stalinists was to say, ah, we're making a united front from below. What they meant is, what, what they were trying to say is, we're not going to go anywhere near those uh, treacherous um, uh, the traitors of the of the social democratic social democratic leadership. We're not going to touch them. We're going to operate, and we're going to make an appeal to the to their to the social democratic workers. They should make a united front with us from below, without involving their leaders. But of course, that was a complete um, prevarication and evasion of the issue because you were not going to win the social democratic workers to fight alongside you. If you start by saying we're having nothing to do with your leadership, the idea of a united front is yes, precisely that we make an appeal to the to the leaders, to the leaders of the uh, of, of the reformists of the social democrats, and um, uh, give them a point blank challenge: Are you going to work with us to defeat the uh, the, the fascists and the class enemy, or are you not? And if you don't, that will expose them in the eyes of their rank and file. And that way, we can win more people to our side. But the um, but the the United Front is a United Front of the entire organisations, including the leaderships, rotten though they might be, bureaucratic as they might be, um, because that's the only way in which you could um, hope to to win support and to win the rank and file of those um, treacherous parties to your uh, to your ranks. And so um, that's that's the reason why, for instance. Why we're calling now in Britain, we're calling for a, for the creation of a new of a, of a mass workers' party. The the Labour Party is no longer a workers' party. It's um, it's been uh, hijacked by um, by uh, a, a reserve army, if you like, of the ruling class. And um, and we're making an appeal. In fact, I'm going to put in the chat the resolution that we that we. Uh, proposed to the um, Socialist Labour Network on Friday night, which was rejected or it was replaced by by a um, by a kind of um, uh, uh, another resolution which watered it down. Which we're still standing firm on. We're still going to uh, campaign uh, on. But it's um, it's to call for the creation of a uh, of a mass workers' party to call on the trade unions to break their links. With the uh, with the Starmer clique, just as the trade unions uh, severed their connections with the Liberal Party in 1900, um, and um, I'll put that in the chat and, and comrades uh, can see. But I mean, the point is that the people who opposed us were saying, "Oh, the working class is not, you know, it's so weak, and it's uh, oh, that the already they're already weeping, uh, crying into their into their beer." You know about how um, the they've settled for um, for less than they um, than they than they'd originally claimed in the strikes and so on, and the working they're being sold out by the boxes. The same old the usual sectarian sneers that we're uh, used to 
with every country that, uh, that, that, that they operate. Um, and that, but I mean, the fact is that the working class has been, it, it, it's actually stronger in society. It's a stronger, stronger uh, center of gravity, has a stronger center of gravity in society than it did in 1900, in 1926. We may have lost the uh, the miners and the um, the car car plant workers and the dock workers and the shipyards and so on. But what we what one thing that has changed is that um, there is no element in society which now would would hold out um, on behalf of the employers and the ruling class when it comes to the crunch. We have you know, we who was it who broke the strike the general strike in 1926? It was uh, civil servants. It was students, teachers, doctors. Uh, now, today, we have strikes of uh, barristers, doctors, uh, civil servants, university lecturers, and so on. There is there is no element. We've had the 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 entire uh, spectrum of of the working class has been involved in action in Britain in the last few months, from Amazon workers and uh, Uber drivers. To um, to as I say, uh, uh, barristers and um, the border force security and all the rest of it. So the point is that um, we we have a better basis now to call for a for a mass party of the working class than uh, that has been uh, that, that even was so in um, in nineteen hundred when the original Labour Party was created. Now the, the we're we're, the way that a united front operates is very simple. You get together all the all the organisations and all the all the um, groups of people that are fighting for this or that aspect of the emancipation uh, of the working class and of the uh, meeting of the needs of the working class. I can give an example. I hope that Carell will speak in this discussion because just yesterday Carell organised um, a very good um, local example of a united front. In uh, in Newham, this uh, working class uh, borough in in London, where we had um, more than thirty comrades came to came to a meeting. There were people who were fighting uh, rent strikes, people uh, fighting uh, on uh, on on strike on picket lines. Uh, there were there were you know um, people fighting against school academizations, people fighting uh, organizing um, food banks on the basis. As Carell always says in the very good slogan, "Solidarity, not charity." Um, I mean, this. I hope she'll get more into it. That, that's the way. That's the kind of example of how to organise United Front, uh, United Front uh, work. Now, the idea of um, Popular Front, United Front. I mean, Popular Front is just again, it's slate of hand. It's a commentary. Because what's the people? A popular front means all the people should get together. Well, if all the people get together, who are they fighting against, for God's sake? <laughs> it's not a question of the people. It's a question of um, the working class against the ruling class. And that's what a united front uh, um, uh, means. Now, Wynne is, um, is working just on the, so those same uh, principles that we want. Uh, we're, not, we're not dictating what the programme should be. The Labour Party, when it was first formed, was uh, it didn't uh, support a socialist programme. It came to that later in 1918, and it clung on to it for 85 years. Uh, but the um, but Lenin called for the affiliation of the Labour Party to the Socialist International, even before it had adopted a socialist programme, on the basis that he said, the Labour Party may not recognise the class struggle, but the class struggle inevitably will recognise the Labour Party. And that's exactly what um, what what transpired in 1918. I'm, oh, I'm, 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 I'm finishing now. That's exactly... Yeah, because just all his weights coming in. Okay. That's sure. what I'm just saying. I'm right. just finishing on, uh, on that okay. note, as I said. But I'll put uh, the resolution that I was talking about in the chat. That's great. Thanks, Roger. We'll bring Carol in next because she just said she has to go soon. Carol, do you want to? Hi. Um, I said two points, and one of them goes to what Roger was talking about, and another to Abu uh, Jabu. Um, 
I don't think the question of United Front is so simple, although it appears to be simple. You know, all the workers get together, whether they have differences on other political positions, but we want to fight around this or that or the other thing. But um, a lot of groups are very sectarian because they really want to build their own organization and they're less interested in building a fight around a particular issue. And so, you know, just to give an example, when when Steve and I were in South Africa and, and we were talking about this resolution that we passed about the Namibian workers, I mean, Stalinism has completely complicated everything. Um, you know, so I, I spoke to somebody, I was trying to raise money for the Namibian miners who have been out of work, as everybody knows, for years. And um, I went over to, to, to Jack Heyman, who is in, uh, uh, was a member of the ILWU, but also was a member of the um, IG. And I said to him, so will you help us raise money? And he said, well, I, we can't really do that because they're striking against China and we support China. And so, so a united front is not, unfortunately, not so simple because it, it involves all these political questions that people just don't understand the nature of what China is, or I don't think they understand the nature of China and that China is repressing the 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 workers in Namibia and in other parts of Africa. And so we have to clarify before we even try to get to the United Front, which would appear to be very simple, but it's not about what the nature of these these particular governments are, so that you know people understand that we have to then go ahead and defend the workers in Namibia. So unfortunately, the question is not so simple. And where it would appear to be simple, it's much, much more complicated. You know, even Trotskyists don't really understand the nature of the Chinese government and Chinese capitalism. And, you know, they don't want to participate. I've, I've asked people to participate. I've asked a number of organizations to support um, the clover workers. And, you know, when they were on strike and I couldn't get them to do that either because they're interested in building their own particular organization. And so they're not really interested in, in building a united front or building a working class struggle in opposition to capitalism and imperialism. And, you know, I'm not really sure how to deal with that. I think that we're going to have to have a movement and a showdown with a lot of the left groups when the movement, when the working class movement really grows. But as of now, the, the problem is, is much more complicated. Unfortunately, it would be great if it was just simple. We're gonna defend this issue or that issue and have our own particular point of view and have our own flyers and all of that. But because people are putting their stakes in what they think that Stalinism somehow or other is a working class institution and therefore we can't attack them and therefore we can't participate in this united front. And, and that I think is a much more complicated issue than, you know, than it appears. So that's it. Thanks, Carol. Carol. Um, Steve, you actually had your hand up next, but Carol's also supposed to hand up. Would you mind if Carol speaks first because she's not spoken yet? Carol, Carol can go first. People haven't spoken yet. Carol, Carol, go first, and then we'll take you. You perhaps uh, make some more comments. comments. That's That's Carol, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'll just give a brief report from yesterday, and I'm really sorry. I was sticking to 4.30, so that shows you should read your email, shouldn't you, comrade? So I will watch it, on, Steve, on, um, on when it's put up on, on social media. So apologies that I didn't hear your lead off, but I will be watching it. So yesterday, as Roger said, we had um, a conference from 12 to 4 o'clock, and um, we start off with a lunch, free lunch for everybody, which tries to pull people in, and it seemed to work. We had over 35 people uh, are there and um, we had a report from uh, we had there was a the same time that we had the conference in Southwark which is in South London there was a, 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 a right to food march I don't know how many people were on it but Ian Byrne 
who's an MP in the north of England, I think near in Derby, he um, came on, um, um, we, we, we had a link with him and he came on the link and he spoke to the conference. Um, so they had, they had a big march and in, Ian Byrne has been organising a right to, national right to food campaign. So um, we were very, very interested to hear what he was saying. And um, I'm sure his march was really successful. So we are going to be copying some of the ideas and linking up with him and with Sharon Gunning, who's been on some of our, tuned into some of our meetings before. So what we're trying to do is to build a broad-based grassroots campaign in our area, not exclusively in our area, because we're, we'll talk to anybody we can, we can talk to, um, who, want, who wants to, to be part of what we're doing. Um, there were activists from the Socialist Party. There were some of us from Newham Socialist Labour who are all ex-Labour ex Party members, either expelled or have left because the Labour Party is so corrupted, um, particularly in Newham. And we had people who are not in any party, people, um, actually we did have two members of the Liberal Democrat Party who came along and participated a bit actually, which is a bit of a surprise. We had people from food banks, we had people who um, were been involved in rent strikes and were part of um, ACORN and London Renters Union. Yeah, I mean, just a wide range of people. And in many senses, what we're trying to do isn't that difficult. We, we've got different points of view, but on one thing we're very clear, we're, we're defending our class against all the attacks that are happening. And the big area that we talked about was food, um, was housing, and then the most political of all was democracy. So we talked for a long time about democratic accountability and the way that our council um, behaves towards us and, and, and treats with complete disdain and lack of respect to the ordinary residents of the borough. And that is not just because they're set in a budget, they've set a budget that's 19 million pounds worth of cuts and raised the council tax almost 5% for people. So the second poorest borough in the country, you know, people are going to face huge cuts to services and they're going to be paying more for less. And I know that's happening everywhere, but 49% of children in Newham are in poverty. That means half of the children in this borough are going to bed at night hungry or their parents are skipping meals so that the kids are not hungry. I mean, it's absolutely catastrophic what is happening to working class people in this country. And when we go to council meetings and we try and put our hand up from different campaigns, I mean, people who are trying to save a little city farm with about four horses, a donkey and a few ducks that they closed down. When they tried to speak at the council meeting, they were closed down. They called the police on us. That's what they're doing. Uh, so it's really serious, the lack of democracy in the council, we're united on that. We are demanding that the, you know, the, M the uh, MP is in, our MP in West Ham is invisible. She doesn't do surgery. So we're demanding accessibility. We're demanding accountability. If they're gonna charge us more money, we want the, uh, ex huge allowances that they get. We want those cut. They should take the cut. We should have our representatives on an ordinary worker's wage, not on a de uh, an elected mayor on 86,000 a year. That's what she's earning, 86,000 a year. So we can happily work with the Socialist Party. Uh, we can happily work with people from different campaigns that are not in any party, but it's, it is difficult. The idea is it is quite a simple one. The reality on the ground is, is difficult, uh, but on the 99% of things that we agree on, we stick together. The 1% of difference is the difference that we 
um, we have to ignore because the left is always splitting and splitting and splitting. So we should be a bit more flexible, I think, and unite together. The only way is from the grassroots up and it's, it's hard work, but very, very exciting. So I hope that's a short enough report. That's, that's great. great. Thanks, Thanks very, very much, Kay Grill. Very inspiring. inspiring. Should we, we go, go back, back to you, Steve, and then it'd be David and Chabu again? Yeah. I, mean, I think that the, um, uh, the issue of the United, United Front method uh, and, uh, is, is critical. I mean, you have to have the ability to unite the working class struggles, class issues together, uh, despite political differences. And I, I give, uh, you know, uh, the question of imperialist war is uh, uh, an important question, particularly in the rise of the question of Stalinism. And um, because as what is happening now is, is the Stalinists uh, internationally are saying that the issue is not the class struggle, the issue is the global South versus the global North. Uh, this is what they're arguing, that we have to uh, support the global South and that would include Brazil under Bolsonaro, that could include Iran, uh, that we have to support those governments against U.S. imperialism. That's what they're arguing. And also we have to support Russia uh, and Putin. And uh, so there have been demonstrations in the United States against the war. And uh, one included uh, libertarians and others who um, are pro-capitalist. Um, but there was the, the, the latest one was on March the 18th, organized by the Party for Socialism and Liberation, which is a Stalinist party, really. Um, and uh, their demands are against NATO uh, for the work for workers' demands, that kind of thing. But of course, they leave out a workers' party and the Democrats. So uh, we uh, participated in a united front basis uh, at in the demonstrations. Uh, and I spoke actually at a rally in San Francisco uh, on uh, the fight for the working class, the independence of the working class, the workers party. And I think that the, the question of um, fighting in the unions is, is very critical because we need a united front of the unions for a labor party uh, against the Democrats and Republicans. And I think we want to unite with those parties, socialist parties or Trotsky's parties, whatever, that for, want a labor party. But that means a fight against the union bureaucracy inside the unions. And most of the left, uh, organizations do not want to directly confront the trade union bureaucracy uh, over the question of a labor party. So I think that the, as a as a uh, united front perspective, we have to fight in the in the in the unions and in the working class for a, a mass democratic workers party. Um, and the um, again the question of Stalinism and I uh, is is critical because the Stalinists. Uh, are, uh, do not want a democratic trade union movement and, and are, uh, do not fight the uh, trade union bureaucracy around a labor party. Um, they want to um, basically recruit to their parties. Now, I, I last, I think that, you know, what we're going into now with move towards war, global war, and also the financial situation. I think all the comrades know about the collapse of these regional banks, Silicon Valley Bank, is that we're heading into likely a financial uh, collapse and panic. Um, and I think it raises on a global level uh, the, the question of what is the working class going to do in, in the face of uh, collapse of the, of, the, of the economy. And I think that raises an issue again of a workers party and a program for a workers party uh, that we, we need to unite workers on, even if they're not for a workers party. Because the question of housing uh, workers, the, the right to have housing, the question of food, um, the question of even the environmental crisis with the uh, flooding that immigrant communities, migrant communities in California face, and more and more communities face uh, regular flooding uh, just you know because of the climate crisis. All these issues are coming to the fore, and they require um, a united front perspective, but they require putting forward a a perspective towards the workers taking power through a workers party, a democratic workers party. So I think I'm uh, optimistic about these growing struggles, um, and unionization struggles in the United States. There, there are many, many union struggles in the United States of worker organizing, which is important politically. Uh, all these uh, are opportunities for a united front perspective. 
And I think that the bureaucracy, the trade union bureaucracy, which uh, supports capitalism, which supports the Democrats, uh, are going to be more and more exposed. Um, and I think that, that the reason is, is that there's the capitalists, unlike the post-war period, unlike the Second World, at the end of the Second World War, can't make concessions to the working class. Uh, they have to attack the working class directly in a frontal way, like they did with the railroad workers, where they ordered them to go back to work without sick days. Uh, this is the Democrats. So I think that, again, the question of a United Front tactic, the question of a, of a workers' party, a mass Democratic Labor Party, are coming to the fore, and we are going to uh, be involved in working with others and also building a movement for a Labor Party with other organizations and, and individuals who see the need for a political uh, party of the working class. Steve, uh, David, back to you. Uh, comrades, it's a, a good discussion and it's it's warming up, I feel. Um, you know, I just wanted to respond to some of the points that uh, Carol made. Uh, and let me just start by saying that the movement which we see internationally is unbelievably active. If we look at what's happening in France and we look at what's happening in many other countries, including South Africa with strikes, it's it's unbelievable mass action by by uh, all peoples and you know who are struggling under you know the capitalist regime, but by the working class. And yet, there's at the same time there's not really a united front and clear demands you know coming uh, being put forward and and being a, a taken up by by the working class. Uh, in in a politically organized political formation, instead, as Carol has pointed out, there's splits and splits and even further splits. So this is why I want to just come back on this question of, you know, united front from below. I think Roger is quite right to say that in the context of the 1930s, was a complete misuse of the term. But in South Africa, I've been discussing in the past period, I mean, with, with many workers, even hundreds now in the last period, uh, and actually there is no attempt by workers' organizations to get together and discuss the issues. The leadership just do not meet at all. In fact, I think I met more leaders individually, uh, uh, you know, because I'm an old man now, and they don't feel it's a threat. So I could see all kinds of people, and, and actually they've never even met uh, other trade union leaders. They just don't even meet at all. It's not as though there's somewhere that the unions are getting together, and then you can address those people and call it, you know, talk to, talk to them, and then talk to them mobilizing their own members. That doesn't happen. So to do any work, you have to actually work from below, and I think that's the term uh, that uh, that Carol uh, mentioned as well. In other words, you've got to talk to workers directly, um, and then with some respect to the leaders, even if you would like to say a whole lot of other points about the leaders, uh, to be able to gain their trust and to be able to build united action. Um, and not just united action in general about strikes, because that's happening all the time, but united action which leads on to a political conclusion that we need a mass workers' party. But for some reason, um, you know, it, at the moment, it's it's almost impossible, it's extremely difficult, you know, to get that political clarity. Um, you know, in South Africa, it's absolutely unbelievable. No one, absolutely not a single person and not a single leader is talking about a mass workers' party in South Africa or even any kind of workers' party. It's all that we must make alliance with one or other more radical, uh, less corrupt leader than the previous one. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's a, I thought this possibly was unique to South Africa, but maybe it's, it's found... Uh, elsewhere. Um, it's a kind of a paralysis. In other words, we are trying to organize a talk, but no one's interested in striking together. That's that's the point. No, not one leader is interested in striking together. So we, we can then become ultra left in a way by, you know, when we realize that. But maybe the best thing we can do is to patiently explain to workers about what's coming, uh, what's happening, the perspectives we have, and then develop the idea as the kernel of, of organization and the approach towards leadership uh, and, and to deal with that. 
So in the, in, there is a drag in consciousness of, of the political need uh, to organize. There's a forward movement in terms of consciousness uh, to take action against bourgeois regimes, yes. But in terms of building um, a, a socialist base and uniting the different working class organizations, I find it extremely poor, you know, poor, you know, very little evidence of that at all uh, in, in South Africa. In fact, there's, there's more segregation and indifference and hostility to each other than there was even in, in the past. And that's a very unfortunate fact. In other words, we can find paralysis uh, because the leadership do not want to even talk to, to, to each other at all. And therefore, when we work from below, because we have to work from below, we have to use the right language, explain patiently, I use that term quite a lot, uh, and try and build from, from below the united action, which leads on to the question of a united action by working class, not an alliance, absolutely hostile to align uh, any alliance with other political formations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you. I'm, I'm just, just going to bring John O'Donoghue next because they haven't spoken yet. Is that okay? So, yeah. John O'Donoghue, whichever one it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Dominic. I just, just on this question of the leadership and the membership, if you like, of the trade union movement. I don't think it's a question of either or. It's it, part of the process of trying to get the leadership to lead is that's the role they should be playing. And if they're not playing that role, you can explain that to the members because part of the struggle is a replacement of the existing leadership. You can't isolate the leadership and say, we'll leave them on one side and we'll just go for the grassroots. You've got to go for the movement. And that's the, 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 the key issue. And it's it's not. You know that that union's rotten because of Joe Bloggs who or Jane Bloggs who happens to be uh, the general secretary or whatever. So I think that's just a, the the small point I wanted to make. And let's face it, if you're a right wing pro capitalist bureaucrat in charge of a union, why the heck would you want members of other unions to meet your members so they can discuss the conditions that they're fighting for? They're not fighting for class unity. They don't want class unity. It's not in their interests. And you've got to patiently explain that. You can't just go up to some trade union member and say, your leader's rotten. Because the next thing is just say, oh, you, you're, you're a nutter. You've got to explain what you've tried to do and try and get them on board to do the same thing in the process of uniting with us. So that, that's a small point, but I just thought I'd make it. Thanks, Dominic. Back to you, Jabu. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dominic, for not being too long. Um, I won't be long as well. I just wanted to go back to, to the Deben moment again and talk about the the kind of issues that I think are really uh, like the elephant in the room, which are not being addressed in terms of the leadership in unions. One of the leaders who came to greet me from Kosatu, uh, which Kosatu was quite, I would say quite uh, absent towards the whole Deben uh, moment issue, as well as not so much so many workers uh, in terms of the representation. We had union leaders, but not much, not many workers, which was quite a disappointment in terms of the Americans that had traveled from the ILWU from the US to come to South Africa, not to meet a lot of workers. I was uh, I was a bit like I was feeling quite bad about that. But having said that, the Kosatu men who commented that uh, they knew my mother in, uh, in terms of the capacity, uh, not from the 70s, but from when she had become one of the bureaucrats, as far as I'm concerned, because she was now established. She wasn't the woman that would have been working in there as a weaver. I said something about, oh, say hi to mom. I've also got a daughter that's uh, studied in Oxford and then he just talked about that life. So as he was talking, I was thinking, ah, so this is what is now missing, which is really incredible in terms of my, uh, my involvement in the movement as far as what I'm doing in Oxford. In Oxford, I'm a city councillor for the Labour Party for an area which is a, an area, a working class area, which has featured heavily on say Philip 
Alstin as a, 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 what we call report, as an impoverished area and has a low life expectancy. Once I live in this area, I was told flat that I should not be expecting anybody to be voting for me. I should not be expecting any support, but I moved around the area and I mobilized. I have the highest majority in my city council. I mobilized this area and I spoke to the people about what was happening. What I really saw in terms of the working class engaging with me as a working class woman who live in their area was the fact that I spoke their language. I spoke about the issues that uh, I mean, Carol, Carol has just uh, uh, kind of outlined in terms of housing, rents, council tax, all the, um, the poverty issues that they understood. Okay, back to uh, the movement itself, the Labour Party that I am part of. I was uh, not welcomed in the Labour Party. Uh, basically, the the, old, the the comments were made about how I managed to mobilize an area that they they deemed emo, not 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 um, political in terms of understanding its plight. And uh, before I could even explain myself to say how I managed to mobilize this area, one of the right uh, wing, uh, one of the people in the right whimpered and said I must have threatened them with a machete. So that is the type of racism that I have had to put up with in the Labour Party in Oxford. But I replied to the woman to say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here in this Labour Party and I'm still here and I'm their chair. But my point here is when we talk about uh, mobilizing and talking to the working classes, we need more people from our areas that can see that there is a space for them. One of, the, one of the things that I see now is going on in the UK, there's a general uh, there's a general move towards going back to the divide and rule issue as far as uh, you know uh, uh, what you call polarizing workers. We are seeing uh, uh, more of say the Asians, for instance, being pushed forward in terms of uh, how, how, how the capitalist uh, system is uh, creating this divide and rule. And this is happening and, and black people are talking about it predominantly. I was uh, conversing with Roger earlier because I saw this Leicester uh, uh, move towards, uh, you know, uh, purging the whole Leicester Council. And that I saw as an opportunity that we have to really uh, kind of uh, merge which is, which is the Every time that there are pages, it seems people just cry and nothing is happening. For me, that is an opportunity that we should seize as a way of seeing that the right is realizing who is powerful in terms of our uh, plight as workers and they are getting rid of those people. And that is an opportunity for us to mobilize around those issues and form uh, stronger allies in terms of uh, mobilizing our areas and working hard in that area. I am, um, I know I am, I'm, I'm always fluctuating between, between the South African uh, kind of roots and, 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 and what you call in the UK. The South African roots for me are my strength. They are my strength in terms of understanding what took place. I recently interviewed my mom again. I always go back to her for comfort when I feel down and when I feel as if everything is falling apart. And she tells me that during uh, the, uh, what you call the frame strike in the 19, in 1973, uh, when, of course I was asking her what made you, you know, what made you take action? What was happening? She first talked about the fact that they were not allowed to unionize as uh, black workers, but what they did have was a strong, uh, what you call a relationship with the Indians who were working in the factory and the colored people. She talked about a man called Peruman. She called this man Peruman, and she talked about another one who was a colored, but they were allowed to be shop stewards, but they were not as black, as, as black people. And one of the things that took place was absolutely incredible in terms of how they fed information to the shop stewards, and then they created a movement towards 
uh, working and collaborating together and actually uh, creating the Deben moment. I mean, she also talks about the distrust. Uh, yeah, we didn't tell him everything because we didn't know what he would feel like. But that kind of uh, unity in terms of working together was there in, 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 in a space where the, the, the political involvement could have meant death or you know, losing your life. And yet we are in, a, in an era at the, at, the, at, the, at the time when social media, the internet has galvanized so many people for us. And people talk about being scared. I, I, I really don't get that. I'm not saying people must, you know, be, you know, risk their lives or whatever. But for me, this is the easiest era that we have in terms of what these people had to face. And many countries that you mentioned here have to face in terms of mobilizing their communities, mobilizing their workers. Thank you. Thanks, Jabu. Uh, so no more hands up at the moment. Does anybody else want to say anything, or should we uh, invite Steve to come back in and make some comments? No? Steve, you want to come back in at this point? Wherever you are? Well, I, I think uh, that this, uh, you know, the, the idea of the United Front, the tactic and the, the method of the United Front is important today and relevant today for the working class. And I think that the, um, uh, it, it varies obviously uh, country by country, but particularly uh, where there's a labor party and the labor party in Britain and the fight in that labor party and a fight for a new mass workers party is, is uh, different than the situation we have in the United States where there is no labor party. Uh, we just have the Democrats, which the union support. So um, I think that the, uh, the potential of uh, uniting the working class around class issues is growing. And I think that we have to take that up and we, we have to bring workers, workers are in struggle and we have to unite the struggle. And I agree with the fact that the union bureaucracy is terrified of uniting workers uh, together in a, in a united front formation. I think that the lessons of, of the struggles in the United States is that, uh, that workers are organizing, they are fighting back, but the move, me, uh, the movement for a general strike, uh, for uniting all these struggles together, is of paramount importance. And I think that there have been mass strikes uh, in in California. There was just a strike of sixty thousand education workers. There was a strike of forty eight thousand uh, ed, uh, education workers at UC. These strikes are going to grow in the United States. And I think we need to fight to unite these struggles together. They are the same. Uh, the struggle for survival, the struggle for living wages, the struggle for housing, all these struggles are united. So um, the United Front Committee for a Labor Party is intent on uh, uniting these struggles, is intent on uniting politically those forces that see the need for a workers party in the unions and a fight against the union bureaucracy. And I think that that is critical. The union bureaucracy are an obstacle globally uh, to the advance of the working class struggle. And we need to fight in a conscious way to unite workers around our demands, but also at the same time fight in an organized way in the trade unions that exist to win these workers over to our perspective. Okay, thanks, Steve. In the absence of any more hands, uh, no one wants to come back in again though. We do seem to reach the end of the discussion. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Not Stephen Rogers. I cut you off before. <laughs> no. Chabu. I just wanted to ask uh, Steve about um, the Mumia Abu Jamal um, solidarity action. How far it's gone? Because I thought something was happening. I think it was the 16th of March. I just have not had anything. If you could just give us some something. Uh, well, I think that we're trying to get more support from unions and uh, actions around the world. I, the judge is supposed to rule by the 16th. Uh, that could be, there was 90 days. So basically uh, there are no actions that I know 
uh, at this point in um, that are taking place in, in at least in uh, in the Bay Area. So uh, continuing the campaign, and as as people may not know, but the in, in San Francisco, the San Francisco Labor Council bureaucrats actually opposed a resolution to support Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, the rally that we had uh, when the ILW had a stop work meeting and a march. So, I mean, this is again an example of the, the trade union bureaucracy oppo actually opposing a, to endorse a rally for Mumi Abu Jamal. So, um, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know of any other new information, Chabu. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say in Oxford, in my branch, I managed to move a motion, which is, has got mostly a lot of, uh, say, right councillors. And I got the motion through, which is going to the AG, uh, to the AMM, which is all members meeting in the party. So I am quite proud of that. And I was hoping that I could get a boost uh, because we still have to move it uh, in the general uh, sort of like the o Oxford, uh, the, the ODLP, which is Oxford District Labour Party. And it would be great to kind of get the energy, what is happening with the campaign. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to find out if there are any new developments and, and get back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Shabu. Uh, will it be Ricardo Ines? Because he's not spoken yet. Ricardo, do you want to go next? Are you there, Ricardo? Yes. Are you coming in now, Ricardo? Right, I don't know what's happened there, Dave. You um, I don't I can you hear? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, so uh, yeah, the issue of the issue of the United Front is a very complicated one, and uh, you know, Trotsky uh, defined it. Uh, you know, uh, at some you know in, in wither France as an action. You know, and then uh, he went extensively in the transitional program. Uh, you know, explaining you, you know what it is and the tactics are uh, adequate in order to advance a uh, perspective and possibilities uh, for victory of the working class. Uh, as for example, if there is a, 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 an attack by an imperialist country against a third world country, we would support you know uh, the defeat of the imperialist country and we would defend the oppressed nation in this. But what uh, does distinguish the Stalinist, na petty bourgeois nationalists and others from real Marxists is that we you know, advocate for the victory of our class as for example, in the oppressed nation against imperialism and uh, against the own local bourgeois uh, class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, and also, you know, there are uh, questions of uh, United Front in the, in, in the questions of, uh, mm -hmm. defense, the, you know, in defense of a worker state. For example, uh, Trotsky defended the Soviet Union even during the Stalinist regime against, uh, you know, uh, imperialism, uh, as opposed as the Shamanites, and, uh, you know, which uh, today the rent descendants are you know the so-called state capitalists that are you know they see no difference for example in you know what it is uh, uh, a the foreign worker state uh, or, or you know just mainly a capitalist uh, a state at the same time you know uh, at least the tendency that i do belong and uh, you know the core you know what i think about a, a class struggle or anti-imperialist of it is, it, it, you know, if, if an Stalinist or a deformed worker state, whatever, you know, uh, is, uh, attacks the working class, we would side with the working class. You know, <laughs> that is a fact. You know, we, we want the working class to defeat the parasite caste that uh, runs the parasite nationalist class that runs a four worker state, if they are a 16 worker state. And uh, as for example, uh, uh, whoever, you know, uh, when, 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 when 
China gave support to UNITA in the 70s and 60s, we do oppose that. We condemn that, uh, you know, a supposedly, uh, you know, the, the foreign worker state was siding with US imperialism. And, uh, you know, it was okay to protest China, Ch China such. And, uh, you know, Trotsky, you know, uh, uh, protested uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, alliances uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, support of bourgeois regimes. So, I mean, uh, Anybody that calls himself a Marxist and does not condemn that China it does all these things that have been mentioned right here, regardless of our differences, it's not even a Marxist because uh, you know if you support workers in Namibia that are being uh, uh, attacked with the complicity of a supposedly a supposedly worker state, well you know th those that advocate that position are not Marxists. They don't support that. They don't defend the working class because union busting is counter-revolutionary, is reactionary, you know, wherever the hell it happens. So uh, I just want to say that. And, uh, you know, the United Front, uh, it, it, is, it is something very uh, transition, transitionary, I'm sorry. As for example, uh, you know, uh, I participated in a white uh, mass movement to expel the United States Navy out of the island of Vieques. And uh, the, the, um, it was successful, you know, uh, expelling those uh, criminal uh, United States Navy bases. It was a victory for uh, the people of Puerto Rico. But, uh, you know, that, that United Front included many uh, opposing uh, views. And I, unfortunately, you know, uh, the working class didn't come out victorious of it, but certainly you could not, uh, you know, uh, segregate yourself from the anti-imperialist and anti, you know, US armed forces struggle, that, that is a fact. So, you know, uh, uh, what we really need, we have been, you know, repeating all over and all over and constantly what we need to have is really an international, you know, uh, independent working class party that uh, has a program, and we can be, we can intervene effectively in uh, all these struggles, transitionary uh, or er or permanently. All right, that's my two cents on this. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much, much Ricardo. Ricardo. David, David, if you could just take a few brief comments from you, perhaps, and then I'll return to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, that will be the end of the discussion this afternoon. And so go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, look, um, you know, at the moment, the critical question is how we mobilize, you know, to get those Rossing shop stewards reinstated by a Chinese state corporation in Namibia. And that's uh, a major issue. Uh, and we've made quite a lot of uh, progress. And I want to thank the, you know, Ricardo and the uh, Argentinian uh, Workers' Party for the statement of support. That's absolutely marvelous. In other words, you know, working as we are and building brick by brick the different parts of the bringing the network into into action on a particular issue, you know, we are going to be able to get results. And the results are not just that we're going to be able to help the Rossing miners, but the results are that the, the network becomes strengthened because we we in united in struggle ourselves and building the confidence in each other to you know to be able to take these struggles right through to a conclusion. I just want to say that I'll be you know I'm trying to mobilize uh, and working to mobilize you know, for a, a demonstration in Durban at the Chinese, uh, you know, consulate there and in Pretoria at the uh, embassy. And, and I'll be going down to DC. Uh, it seems a little bit problematic in terms of how many others there may be, but I'm hoping to get Sarah, you know, to give us some links uh, so that we can have more, more people there. But whatever the case, we're going to be a, a united action right across continents internationally against the Chinese bureaucracy. And that's actually a marvelous achievement. And I look forward to hearing the results as they come in. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, David. Steve, do you just want to make a few closing comments? Well, I mean, again, I would just add, we have to build uh, a united fronts uh, globally and in, in the places where we work, where we live. 
and uh, the, this uh, fight for United Fronts can, as, as Ricardo said, lead to building of a new international working class movement. Um, I think that that's what our task is. We can't fight capitalism in our own country alone. It's an international fight and global capitalism now uh, um, is, uh, is, is destroying the world, uh, is destroying the environment and is leading towards world war. So this is a life and death question for millions, hundreds of millions of people actually in this period that we're in. It's a life and death question. And we have to uh, use our lessons of the working class struggles in the past and, and the fight fights that have made in the past to develop a, a, a new world working class movement that can defend the working class. This is a question of survival for the world working class and the people of the world. Right, thanks, Steve. That's, That's in the discussion. Thanks very much to Steve for leading so well today. And also thank you to everybody who made contributions to the discussion. Uh, right, so I'm going to move on now to see if Roger wants to tell us about next week's meeting. I can't remember. Yes, uh, there's, um, of course, there's the threat of um, a huge financial crisis looming, maybe, maybe impending quite soon. And uh, the we're very lucky to have once again Michael Roberts, the uh, really uh, foremost Marxist economist, uh, to explain the issues to us. So Michael Roberts next week on the financial crisis. Okay, thanks Roger. Okay, well, that's the end of the meeting. Thank you to everybody for your attendance and uh, I declare the meeting closed. I hope to see you all next week. And bye for now. Bye. -bye.